Hello and welcome. Marvel UK was a publishing imprint established in 1972. It existed to print mainly black and white reprints of Marvel Comics material for a British audience. Basically, these were compilation titles that were formatted to the standard British comic book size. In 1976, Captain Britain was created and given a solo title to give Marvel UK something unique to offer its audience. The creation and design of the character was entirely done in the United States by Chris Claremont and Herb Trimpey. These short episodes were then sent to the Marvel UK offices to be printed. The character itself wouldn't debut in a North American title until 1978. The solo Captain Britain title would only last 39 issues before being cancelled, although the character continually appeared in various titles following that cancellation. It wouldn't be until 1979 that the character was finally written and drawn by a British creative team. This ongoing story, retroactively known as the Otherworld Saga, teamed Captain Britain with the Black Knight. Otherworld was, essentially, Avalon, an alternate world steeped in magic and Arthurian legend. At the end of the story, Captain Britain is sent home with his new companion, Jackdaw. This is where the modern, more recognizable version of Captain Britain begins. The editor, Des Skin, who was hired in 1978, spearheaded the move for Marvel UK to produce original material by British creators. This led to new material being included in Doctor Who Weekly, Star Wars Weekly, and the Marvel Comics reprint anthology titles. Unfortunately, Marvel UK was given a micro-budget to pay for artists and writers. Original material quickly declined to a point where very little was being produced. The company simply couldn't afford to pay creators. However, one concession was the creators retained rights to their work. The characters may be owned by Marvel, but the rights to the actual writing and artwork stayed with the creators. The redesign of Captain Britain was initiated by Paul Neary, the editor that replaced Des Skin when he left to start the anthology Warrior. Neary hired the new, inexperienced artist Alan Davis and the staff writer David Thorpe to redesign and to write new adventures for the character. A new design was considered necessary because the original design was too quaint and lacked a sense of power. According to Davis, the lion on the character's chest was a symbol commonly used in Britain to denote the quality and freshness of eggs. So its effect was opposite to its intention. The redesigned character debuted in Marvel Super Heroes No. 377 in September 1981. The new story picks up exactly where the previous adventure left off. Captain Britain and Jackdaw find themselves arriving on Earth-238. This is a world similar to Captain Britain's original world, but with some distinct differences. For one, superheroes or vigilantes are outlawed. It's a world being transformed by Opal Luna Saturnine, the Omniversal Magistrix of the Dimensional Development Court. Her job is to protect the Omniverse. According to Saturnine, Earth-238 is the most primitive Earth, and its stunted growth is affecting all the worlds in the Omniverse. Overall, this ongoing story had some heavy political overtones, and this is what led to David Thorpe being replaced. According to Alan Davis, he objected to a Captain Britain story that attempted to resolve the conflict in Ireland. It seemed to diminish the reality and the concerns of the country by using a distinctly British icon as a solution to the problem. The editors agreed with Davis, and Thorpe was immediately replaced with a newcomer to the mainstream, Alan Moore. Officially, Moore took over the writing chores with Marvel Super Heroes 387, but his first actual work was the final page in the prior episode. It's a very brief setup for the storyline that would follow. Right from the beginning, the story takes a dramatic change in direction and tone. A minor villain, Jim Jaspers, warps reality into a nightmare version of itself. Simultaneously, an entity known as the Fury, who had previously destroyed all superheroes on the planet, arises to do the same to Captain Britain. Jackdaw is killed, Saturnine flees for her life, and Captain Britain stumbles to a graveyard where he is murdered by the Fury. Merlin and his daughter, Roma, intervene and literally rebuild Captain Britain. A new body is recreated, and his past and personality are restored. He's then returned to his original world, Earth-616, and the Omniverse chess game begins again. What follows are a few tales to set up future developments, such as the evolved artificial intelligence in the caves under Captain Britain's home, and Saturnine losing her position as the Omniversal Magistrix. 
the Fury finds its way to Earth-616. The Jim Jaspers of this Earth comes to power and unleashes his nightmare vision on Great Britain. It all comes to a highly satisfying cataclysmic finale. Despite the victory, there is a cost, and its conclusion is suitably downbeat. Overall, the story feels like a very complete, minor epic. Captain Britain was one of Alan Moore's first superhero works. This and Marvel Man were started at roughly the same time, and they debuted a few months apart. Coincidentally, Moore wrote both simultaneously for roughly the same amount of time. Although, it would take a few more years and a change of publisher before Marvel Man was complete. Whereas, with Captain Britain, he completed the story he started without a break in publishing. Captain Britain was one of the few times Moore indirectly worked for Marvel Comics. Although, he did write a few Star Wars and Doctor Who stories that were also published by Marvel UK. Curiously, Moore reused some characters from his earlier Doctor Who stories, War Dog and The Executive, in the Captain Britain run. Moore also included a few blatant Marvel Man references in Captain Britain. While these are very minor appearances, in which he turns out to be a superhero killed by the Fury, what is interesting is the fact that Marvel Man is known as Miracle Man. This is not a name the character would adopt until the series was published by Eclipse in 1986. However, the other names on the tombstones in the graveyard were disguised names for classic British heroes. For example, Android Andy was a reference to Robot Archie. The arachnid is the spider. So Marvel Man being referred to as Miracle Man is simply a variation on changing the name of a known British comic book icon. Still, it's mildly ironic that this is the name the character adopted to avoid legal issues from Marvel Comics. And it's a name that originated in a Marvel comic. For more trivia, this run of Captain Britain is why the main Marvel Universe was known as 616. This is the designation it was given by Alan Moore in this series. For the record, it's very unlikely this was a random number choice. In very early biblical writings, the number 616 was the number of the beast, not 666. It's believed that 666 may have been a mistranslation or an attempt to suggest the Roman emperor, Nero, was the mythical beast. This is a piece of information that Moore more than likely knew, and this designation was his obscure criticism of Marvel Comics. Captain Britain is one of the first examples of the deconstruction and renewal of a character by Alan Moore. He would apply this technique to both Miracle Man and Swamp Thing. And years later, he would take the same approach to Supreme. With all of these examples, he broke the character down without ignoring the established continuity and then rebuilt the character to be, conceptually, more interesting. Then he created an apocalyptic story to challenge the protagonist. All three characters are quite distinct, but the elements are roughly similar. Again, this may be due to all three being contemporary works. It's difficult to not only spot similarities, but to compare them to one another in an effort to chart Moore's creative process and evolution. Within Captain Britain specifically, one sees Moore develop rather clearly. He begins the series by writing a bit too much. Over the course of a year, his writing becomes much tighter, and the words in the pictures merge and enhance one another, rather than being two separate elements attempting to tell the same story. Put another way, Moore develops an economy of language and learns to trust the artist, in this case, Alan Davis, to represent the visually necessary information. At the same time, Alan Davis also flourishes as an artist. Some of the early work before Moore took over is a touch rough. This is the result of a new talent with some reasonable skills learning his craft in public. Because of some tight deadlines, Davis had to get the work done rather than get it perfected. So the results are variable from episode to episode. By the conclusion of the series, he and Moore display a confidence that is present on the page. According to Davis, he had a fair amount of input on Captain Britain. Not so much on the direction of the story, but on the density of the script. In some cases, the text was too dense for the sequence. So an eight-page script was broken down into more pages so it could be told in an organic, visual manner. It was more work for Davis, but the end result made for a story that was less cramped with dialogue and captions. This may be one reason why Moore's writing becomes tighter over time. He began to incorporate suggestions so the text wouldn't overwhelm the art, or so Davis wouldn't need to expand the script into more pages to accommodate the story. 
As a notable aside, while working on Captain Britain, Davis and Moore would work together on Marvel Man, when the original artist Gary Leach decided to step aside from that project. Not only that, but Moore and Davis also produced DR and Quinch at the same time for 2000 AD. So during the early 80s, they were practically inseparable. The three contemporary stories, Captain Britain, Marvel Man, and Swamp Thing, begin with a revelation that leads to a new status. For Miracle Man, it's remembering the trigger word, Kimoda, and the realization that he's a superhero. His new status is being a superhero, not a powerless, middle-aged nobody. For Swamp Thing, it's the realization that he is not human and never will be. His new status is being a plant elemental. Additionally, there is Supreme. Supreme discovers the supremacy and has the realization that he's just the most current iteration of Supreme. For Captain Britain, he is literally destroyed and restored to life. His new status is to be part of something larger than himself. In a manner of speaking, he does symbolize the spirit of Great Britain itself. He is the centerpiece of a crumbling empire. Also, like Supreme, there are other iterations of himself, the Captain Britain core. Unlike Supreme, these other versions exist throughout the multiverse. It's implied they are the police force for the Dimensional Development Court. Conceptually, this element is similar to the Parliament of Trees, who are past iterations of the Swamp Thing. They exist to offer guidance when necessary. Additionally, this element honors the past of the character without being beholden to that past. More to the point, Moore neither diminishes nor condescends to any prior silly developments that may have occurred in the character's past. Everything is incorporated, and that which is unnecessary is put to the side. In the case of Captain Britain, the comic relief character, Jackdaw, is killed in a rather gruesome and memorable manner. His death signals that tragedy is ahead. After all, the comedian is dead. There are also a few shades of V for Vendetta in Captain Britain. This is personified by the internment camps set up to house captured heroes. It's a story beat that's somewhat undeveloped, though. It's an escalation that abruptly occurs between chapters, and it sits there in the background just to enhance the atmosphere. It's like something Moore would have done more with had this not been a mainstream superhero comic. There is some light political commentary, too. Jim Jaspers is a conservative public figure who distorts reality for his own evil agenda. Presumably, it's a slightly disguised observation concerning the government ruling Britain in the early 80s. It's quite toned down, and not as obvious as the bleak, totalitarian government in V for Vendetta, but the criticisms expressed are somewhat similar. It's quite interesting how Captain Britain is something of a snapshot or a messy blueprint for the majority of the work Alan Moore did in his early mainstream career. As stated earlier, all of these works share a commonality, but they're done in a unique manner. Moore isn't necessarily repeating himself, he's refining the process of deconstruction and renewal. Also, it is a story with some weight. It isn't as heavy as Swamp Thing or Miracle Man. In fact, its closest relative would be Supreme so it's a more accessible tale that may have appealed to a wider, general audience. Unfortunately, its relative obscurity keeps it from being discovered. At the end of the storyline, Alan Moore quit the Captain Britain series. He states his reason as being in protest of the editor, Bernie Jay, being fired. Alan Davis suggests the true reason was due to Moore not being paid in a timely manner, because, in actuality, Jay wasn't fired. She quit her position and moved on. There may have been other factors in Moore's decision to leave this acclaimed series. At the time, Marvel Comics had sent a letter to Warrior claiming the Miracle Man character infringed on their trademark. This irked Alan Moore because it was a ridiculous claim. After all, Marvel Man was created years before Marvel Comics existed. Finally, Moore had begun work on Swamp Thing, and he was receiving exposure to a wide North American audience. So, simultaneously working on a slightly obscure but highly regarded title for a company that threatened legal action against another title he was writing, and the loss of a very good editor, or not being paid, or both, probably all fed into Moore's decision to leave Captain Britain. Regardless of his reasons, Moore did stay with Captain Britain until the very end. He does complete the story he set out to tell. Captain Britain is a series that is difficult to locate in its entirety. Due to Moore's past disagreements with Marvel, the run has only been sporadically reprinted. 
While Marvel may own the character outright, Moore owns the copyright to the stories he wrote. Therefore, Marvel needs Moore's explicit permission to reprint the series. Reportedly, Moore only allowed the stories to be reprinted to make amends to Alan Davis. When Eclipse reprinted Marvel Man in 1986, they failed to secure the rights to the artwork from Davis. But they reprinted the series anyway, and Davis was never compensated. Allowing Captain Britain to be reprinted repaired some of the damage done to their relationship, which essentially fell apart following Marvel Man. The best version of this story, excluding the original black and white issues, was reprinted as X-Men Archives featuring Captain Britain in 1995. Not only is the story complete, but it was also printed in color. This was published in one single volume in 2002, but both examples are long out of print. A small fraction of the story is reprinted in Legacy of a Legend from 2016. Otherwise, it's not a story easily obtained in North America. In the end, Captain Britain is a piece of work that's somewhat overlooked due to the amount of more popular, influential work Alan Moore was producing at that time. However, it's of a quality and caliber of those other contemporary works. It may not be as meaningful as Marvel Man or as impactful as Swamp Thing, and it's certainly nowhere near as nihilistic as V for Vendetta, but Captain Britain shares a fair amount of commonality with those titles. It is a solid piece of work that fits comfortably in its own niche. That's it for today. Like, share, subscribe, and comment, and I will talk at you later. Until next time.